Hey all, Chris from Lafayette, Indiana rock band, June IND here, and I'm joined by Vanessa Pacheco, community outreach coordinator, and Eric David, legal coordinator from the Greater Lafayette Legal Defense Fund. The Guild Fund is our December Philanthropy Music for a Cause beneficiary, and we'll be donating this month's sales and streams to them to directly aid individuals and family members who are disproportionately impacted by systemic racism within the criminal legal system. Hey, Vanessa. Hey, Eric. How's it going? Oh, man. We are so good. We were just talking off the call, though, how important it is that since we've learned so much in this process that um, we get the opportunity to share it with the community. So we're grateful to you for this time. Oh, no problem. Eric, you doing all right? I am super great. Uh, I, every minute I've spent with the Guild Fund has felt like a huge learning experience. And uh, I, again, I echo what Vanessa said about being grateful to share that on a wider platform. So thank you. Well, we'll do our best to get that out there. And, you know, the, the idea is to um, uh, hopefully help you help more folks. So um Let's get into it then. Uh, let's talk about the Guild Fund. Um, how long have you been around? What's the mission? The uh, the Guild Fund has been around in a lot of iterations um, since the summer of 2020. Um, though I personally like to say that we didn't really start until Eric joined us um, in November of 2020. So, um, of course, it was a really, uh, I think, a global pandemic is like a really intense and also really organic place um, for mutual aid to start. And so um, for us, we were just kind of looking around and noticing that um, young people in particularly, they were being really deeply harmed over the summer um, just for um, really kind of participating in their very first, for some of them, their very first civic experiences, right? Getting out in the streets, um, you know, like having deep conversations with people maybe they've never met about issues that are important to them, um, but they're getting punished for those conversations indirectly or directly. And so um, for us as uh, like a community filled with civic agents, a lot of us kind of started to get together and we're really concerned about what was coming on in this community. And so um, from that conversation emerged um, like a deep desire um, to change not only um, the way that we respond to harm in our community, but also um, how can we interrupt uh, a system where folks are headed and thrown directly into the carceral system um, and thus starts a really tricky cycle, right? Because um, we are also proud abolitionists and know that once somebody enters that system, um, harm is just gonna continue to happen. It just creates more and more harm. We know that jails and prisons do not work. Um, and so I think a lot of what we're passionate about, and, and I'm going to put it to Eric here, um, is about first eliciting and helping people understand what is this system like so that we can understand why it doesn't work, why we need to contribute to help stop it. Um, and so um, at the core of that is building relationships. And so we've been really proud to like build relationships with, with families and help them understand like, how does this carceral experience intertwine and interconnect them? In, in the work we've done with Guild, I think one thing that has really stood out to me is um, the perception people have of the criminal legal system and the law in general. Um, and I think where that starts for a lot of people is that the law is just this objective fact that exists um, sort of outside of the context of society and time. And that gets applied objectively onto people in the context of the, the things that they do wrong or the crimes they commit. Um, which for me, I know uh, is not at all what happens. Um, and really like the criminal legal system is a series of subjective decisions being made by people in power that really have an impact on some of the people in our community who have the least amount of power. Um, so I think um, we have learned through video and technology over the last decade that, that, that usually that starts with police um, and police making decisions or acting on biases that really harm and impact uh, people of color or uh, low income people. Um, but that that cycle and that dynamic really perpetuates throughout the system because then you're involved with prosecutors and then you see judges and then um, you know, you're know you incarcerated. And so you have you know, prison guards and wardens who are these people with great amount of power 
applying their own subjectivity, their own biases through this, this perceived objective fact of law. And so I think Guild really positions itself as um, trying to disrupt that power imbalance at every single level, or at least at every level that, that we can wedge our way into. Um, so like I said, all of the steps in those processes, um, you know, people of color, low income people, they, they tend to lose because they, the cards are just stacked against them. And so to the extent that an organization or a community like Guild can get in there and interrupt things, then start to see different results. Um, and I think that's a huge win for the community. The abolition movement seems to have grown stronger in the last few years, but some people might still struggle with how to respond to crimes that are particularly harmful. How does Guild approach these cases? Yeah, I I love that you asked that question, especially early on, because we we try to debunk a, a lot of like notions of um, you know what it means to be a bad or a good person pretty early on in the in um, any conversation we have about prisons and jails. Right? It's one of the first things that that maybe um, like gets, gets asked of you at the kitchen table when you say you're an abolitionist. Um, and so, yeah, I think the big question that people have is, okay, well, you know, what about the people that are, you know, either just born bad, um, which, um, you know, that term gets thrown out around a lot. Um, what happens to people who've done such serious harm, um, you know, that we, we have to protect ourselves, right? Um, and so first, I, I usually like to rewind and talk about, um, you know, um, oftentimes the first time we uh, ever get into trouble um, as young people, what we learn is that um, the way that we get punished is maybe by getting sent to a corner um, or uh, maybe like a timeout situation um, or we're physically harmed as a result of that. Um, and so we learn really early um, that punishment is the best way um, to um, resolve conflict, um, when in reality, um, what we've learned through uh, trying that and scaling that up with the prison industrial complex is that solutions like that, um, they don't support the person that is accused, but they certainly don't support the person um, who maybe was harmed. Uh, and also that those two people might not be exclusive, right? Um, that it might not be that um, I'm only a victor, victim or I'm only a perpetrator, right? Oftentimes the people we work with um, are not just perpetrators um, or sometimes not only victims, but they're also um, often, um, you know, they've been harmed by um, poverty, right? They've been harmed by homophobia. They've already been harmed um, by those things existing in institutions of education, um, in the workplace, right? Um, and so for us, um, we like to get to the root and pull that out, you know, rather than um, trying to figure out, you know, who's good and who's bad, because all of us are so complex. And so for us, um, when we get a case where there is extreme harm done, let's say, for example, um, it was a violent crime that this person has been accused of, um, we try to take that in context, right, um, of culture. Um, often we say, like, this system sometimes does bullying for, uh, start uh, with the police, but sometimes it can start with us policing each other, right? Um, and so maybe I'm somebody that moved into a neighborhood that's new. I don't know how to communicate with my neighbor. It seems like they're yelling a lot. Maybe the first thing I do is call the cops, right? Um, but a lot of that is uh, done through such a cultural lens, right? So maybe I come from a more quiet culture. Um, you come from a culture that's maybe a little bit more uh, vocally vivacious, right? So um, then black folks start to get criminalized more than white people just from that one interaction. Right. Um, and so we try to take all of those cases within that context that might say what cultural difference is present here um, that maybe folks aren't understanding and maybe they've decided that person is bad um, when really there's so much more at play. And so um, we like to ask all of those questions and we also like to, um, you know, have conversations, real conversations with our clients about how they're feeling so far navigating the system and also about what happened, the harm that was done. Um, we can have those conversations honestly. And um, one of the things I'm most proud of, of in the work that we get to do is, is actually having those tough, tough conversations. Like, yeah, it really sucked that that happened, right? Like what would happen if I had a chance to do that again, you know? Um, but it can be scary to have honest conversations like that. 
um, in the carceral system because then what you're guilty right um, and so we're so much harm has been created already because we're so afraid of getting in trouble in our society like I said getting hidden away go getting a timeout getting hit um, we're so afraid um, of guiltiness um, that it can be really scary to be honest and actually repair harm um, being able to say hey I did that and I'm sorry how can I make it up to you um, we don't have scripts for that in our world. We don't have um, pathways for that. Um, and that's particularly how marginalized people tend to do business, right? Um, and so I think there's so much wisdom in that community. So I think bottom line, how do we approach situations where someone's done immense harm? We acknowledge the wisdom that they already have inside them, right? We don't assume that we know better. Um, we don't assume that we can come in and judge them. Um, and so that's that's what I love most about what we do. How much does a good criminal defense cost? Um, and are there other expenses associated with being involved in the carceral system? Ooh, yeah, well, maybe we tag team, Eric. I'll start with sure. the big number, with the big juicy number. So um, <laughs> there's a lot of costs, um, you know, up front and throughout the process. And that's sometimes the most fun thing about what we do, right? because we sometimes find fees that like, just feel like they're coming out from like the sky, you know? Um, <laughs> some of them feel real made up sometimes, you know, like a tax on, um, you know, putting money on someone's books so that they can buy a toothbrush, right? Um, but let's just start with the, what we know is the biggest expense and that's a trial defense attorney. Um, let's just say that this case is gonna take a year that could run us um, up about $50,000. So um, it's not cheap to hire an attorney. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing, but then there's like a lot of little minor things um, that like that sort of cost, I guess we can, Eric, do you wanna talk about commissary and then we can like wind back up to some of the other stuff? Yeah. Um, so I, I think maybe this would be an interesting way to talk about like how Guild operates throughout the process of someone being incarcerated. Um, and in particular, like the, the difference between being incarcerated in jail and being incarcerated in prison. And I'll just say quickly that like those two things are different. They have, there are words that have different meanings and depending on what state you're in, they might even have other meanings than that. But a good way to remember it is that jail is typically run by the county and it is a temporal, uh, uh, a temporary and transient place that's mainly used to like house people who are awaiting trial or like still involved in the the court system we'll say and then prison is a state facility where people who have already been sentenced go to serve like much longer amounts of time um so it might be obvious then if you have that difference in mind like um you can kind of imagine the the type of place that a jail is and the type of place that a prison is but one thing that's really important right now during COVID is that there are a number of people who have been in jail for well over a year, maybe even over two years, just because their trial has been pushed back on account of the delays with COVID. So um, then the, the secondary effect of that is that there are people who are just living in a place that is not designed to be lived in for that long of a time. Um, and, and in my opinion, that's, that's really scary. Um, so when, when that comes to like talking about expenses and how Guild has fit into that, it's like, um, I think if you were say serving like a five year prison sentence, um, you would, you'd be much more able to like develop some sort of routine. Um, the prisons are kind of set up for a person to be able to, um, you know, have an amount of money, like have a an actual cell with an actual room that has like um you know there there's some degree of like predictability in a prison and in a jail it's just like people are moving in people are moving out you're getting moved around um so the money that you have access to is actually really important and in in incarceration that's called commissary so you're able to have like a balance of uh some money where you can buy things like toiletries snacks um just other little items that you and I are very accustomed to having, um, which we would definitely consider necessities um, that are not provided as part of your stay in 
a facility like that. Um, you could probably imagine that um, because they are literally a captive audience, these things are like wildly expensive, much more expensive than they are um, to you or I. Um, and on top of that, like Vanessa mentioned, there is uh, various ways that like the money coming in from the outside to these people is taxed. Um, like we're working with a client right now who I'm sending money every two weeks or Guild is sending every two weeks. And we're trying to figure out a way to like the cheapest way to send him money. Because if you just send it through the online portal, they, they tax it 10% after every dollar after $15 is like 10%. So if you send a significant amount of money, you're just kind of blowing 10% of that back to the county. Um, and they're, I think kind of profiteering on that. But um, the point is, is that it can be really expensive to be in prison. And oftentimes, um, like the people we're talking about who are already uh, victims of poverty, like there is just not money to survive in a place like jail for over a year. Um, and, and so that becomes like, um, like a matter of survival um, and like a daily matter of making sure that not only you have like a certain amount at one time, but that you have a plan for getting money like throughout this indefinite period um, that you're going to be in jail awaiting trial, which could be moved um, and, and you have no control over that either. So it can be really scary. Wow. Is that, uh, I'm guessing, one of those situations where people kind of feel forced to plead, even though they could be completely innocent? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. People are left so vulnerable to these systems, particularly because they're also getting messages from people about what they should do that come from like so many different angles, right? So, um, you know, part of what we have to do is like help people to not feel manipulated because there's a lot that's pulling on you as a person that's going through the system of like, who am I accountable to, right? It's not clear um, when we're dealing with a, like with a, any kind of case that we deal with, it's not really clear like who somebody really is accountable to a lot, whether it was your right to vote, whether it was your right to have housing, um, a lot of those things are frequently contingent upon, you know, what folks with money think that poor people deserve, you know? Um, and so the pressure to make the right decision before you even make it to the courthouse um, and every moment in between is so scary. There's so much more surveillance on what like black and brown people do all the time um, that it can be really, really tricky to know like, yeah, what is the right move here? So that's, that's a great question. So what have you learned about our community in this work? And uh, are there any unique challenges that criminally accused face in our community specifically? That is a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think hearkening back to something I said at the beginning um, with this idea that uh, the application of the law in particular in the criminal legal system is um, largely a product of subjectivity and, and people in power making decisions based on their own sense of morality, their own sense of how the system should work. Um, and that is true in Tippecanoe County. And I think what we have seen is um, a surprisingly aggressive prosecutor and prosecutor system, um, which has, again, made some of those decisions about how to apply the law, um, in particular to very young people. Um, so people who, um, like, there is a question as to whether they would be charged as an adult or as a minor. And the prosecutor in Tippecanoe County has made the choice to uh, prosecute them as adults, which carries much higher sentences and uh, is really, really scary. And so I think um, in Tippecanoe County, that's something that community members should know. Um, and like Vanessa was saying, like oftentimes people who are not threatened with the dangers associated with poverty or not threatened with the dangers associated with being a non-white person in a community like that um, they don't quite understand like then the the added danger of having another person in power at another step in this process who is going to make a decision that could really really harm you for 
a long time out into the future. And so something I've learned um, in this work um, and as an attorney, and I just think that like the community at large uh, would be well served to understand that as this is uh, a matter of elections. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. Like, I, I think more than anything, what I've learned too is just how like hungry I think people are for this reimagining of what the world could look like. And I think that does start with like elections and understanding like who makes what decision. Um, and because the more power we recognize as individuals that we have, um, the more control we can have collectively over how we handle tough situations. Um, you know, going and moving into a community without thinking that it's going to be hard sometimes or confusing sometimes is like going into a relationship like with someone and thinking it's never going to be hard. We're never going to disagree. Right. Um, and I think I really learned how ready this community is to have those tough convos. Like, okay, you see somebody dealing drugs on your front lawn or on your front porch. What's the next step, right? Um, the next step could be called the cops. Um, but what are all of the other things that are available to you? If that's a boundary, if uh, I just, if you just don't want that happening on your front lawn, what's the next step, right? Um, and and folks are really willing to get into that and and talk about like, okay, well, what 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 realistically can I do, right? Or what realistically should I do? Um, and and what we always say is the first answer is to always get to know your neighbors, right? It sounds simple. It sounds very Midwestern, and that's the best part about it, right? So. Um, you know, knowing your neighbors is such a like amazing gift and it can also just transform the way that we address problems, right? So people don't have to get hurt. Um, and so that we can grow together and know each other more and support each other better. Um, you know, so for us, we're just, a, you know, as Eric mentioned earlier on the call and I learn every single time I'm with him, um, but I really loved um, the way that he kind of talked about um, just the fact that like we kind of want to get into the gear of the PIC of the prison industrial complex and uh, and we want to get into the gear of what it's like to navigate the the criminal um, like punishment system. We want to get in wherever we fit and interrupt it there. Right. Um, and so I just think like us having these tough conversations is like such a big way to interrupt um, in the system because suddenly we're not funneling people into the system anymore. Suddenly we're having open and honest conversations about what um, you know our boundaries are and what harm could look like to us and what the opposite, what support could look like to us. Um, you know, um, so I just think so much awesome stuff can come from that. And it already has, we've already had so many good conversations with people that we never even met about um, like their feelings about prison, their feelings about like their neighbors. And um, so there's, there's like some really shiny, awesome, amazing outcomes that have come from this as well so awesome um yeah it's and who knows where some of this stuff starts i mean i i've heard you know the kids talk about cops and robbers and good guys and bad guys and you know you kind of kind of interject be like whoa let's talk more about the bad guy if they're not not bad maybe there's more there to unpack <laughs> yeah you could do like a critical rewatch of disney movies or something and be like what do we think of Ursula, really, right? What are the, what are the questions that need to be asked? Got to interrupt in all of those places. <laughs> right. All right. So, what is the first step when you get connected to a criminally accused community member? So often, the first step is kind of twofold. I think um, I'll pivot to Eric when we talk about like the the portions that are particular that can be like particularly tr tricky to navigate. But the first thing we want to do um, is start with building trust. So um, we as a group um, feel like we started from a place of deep trust and community, um, this feeling like we could navigate a lot of tough things together. Um, and we want that to continue to grow every time we have another client. And so um, the first thing we do is build a relationship with whoever our client has assigned um, as like their sort of trust support system. So in one case with like a young person, it might be um, their parents, right? Um, so really getting and eliciting some important questions and some of those important questions to us are, what do you love about your child, right? Um, what do you see in him that excites you? Um, you know, so um, we start with those questions because we wanna get to know 
um, like our client outside of the, um, the, the current context that we're in, right? Because they have so much more, we wanna emphasize that they have so much more to their life than this incident, right? Um, and that's also just not the way that, uh, that, that we feel like they can be defined. And so, um, so we kind of get in there, but also talk about like, what are the things that your child is really into? What do they really love? Um, and this is more so if we have a client who's, um, you know, under the age of 18, um, but um, we just try to build those relationships that um, help them feel supported so that we're starting to get to know them and understand how do they like to receive information? So it's not just the channels of information, like the boring stuff of like email or text or whatever. It's also like, you know, do you prefer to receive like all of this legalese on the front end or is this something that we should talk about in a different way? Um, you know, what are some like key um, sort of like ideas that are important for you to latch on to? We start to really recognize what, um, how often and how the family wants to be updated um how often the client wants to be updated and about what right so kind of like getting all of those norms out of the way um is important to us because um if we get halfway down um the pipeline and our client doesn't trust us how can they expect that um, or how can we expect that we're going to find them a lawyer they can trust or that they're going to um you know find um like the information from the judge and be able to feel like we can decode that for them if that's necessary um, so I think for us, we start with some really foundational building blocks um, so that we can recognize their brilliance um, and, and through that they can trust us because they're also getting to know who we are, what we're good at, what we're not so good at, because at the end of the day, we're also just like really human. Yeah, and I would just add to that. Um, I think like Vanessa, there's like no way to understate the, the things that Vanessa is talking about in terms of supporting a person who finds themselves in the crosshairs of this system which is like designed to punish it's designed to harm um it's designed to like snatch people away from their lives um so like that is like there's like a void in which we are like pouring love and support um it, there could never be enough to like uh counteract what they're up against um then I think there is like another side of it though, which is which is sort of the logistics or like the legal strategy um, involved in, like we said, like disrupting these points in the system where a lot of these decisions are being made. Um, we we do not and we do not represent them legally, right? So um, we call ourselves a legal defense fund because really what we're designed to do is is support people and kind of be the wraparound support that people need, including hiring an attorney um, in order to get themselves out of this situation. So um, in the past, that's uh, that's been what we've done. Um, a, a large part of that is raising money. And it would be a missed opportunity in this conversation not to talk about um, that and what we do. We've ra We have literally raised and then spent like tens of thousands of dollars since we have started which um like every time we hop on a call together kind of blows my mind um so there's there's hiring an attorney they're supporting them while they're, they're incarcerated um I, I think it all kind of really happens quickly because it has to um because there are all these people who are whose job it is to uh prosecute and and to make these decisions that will harm them so um i think now a year and a half into this almost two years we've started to develop some relationships with lawyers with other people in the community who we can kind of like connect with and then triage the situation and and hopefully start mounting a legal defense as soon as possible um, and I think we're only getting more successful as time goes on and we, we develop more connections. That's awesome. Um, I can imagine being in that situation where, I mean, like, you have no options, but then here comes Guild with some options. Um, so what feels like a success or a win for the team? I actually want to answer this question by bouncing off of something Vanessa just said, which is this sense that I have, and Vanessa and I were actually talking about this earlier, of like how 
poised the community already was to support this type of work. Um, and, you know, Guild is made up of like a handful of relatively young people um, who are in, in and about the community, um, who are interested in doing this work, but like, we definitely don't have $60,000 in our pockets um, that we could donate to these causes. And so the fact that that money has come and the fact that, um, which is not the result of us begging, you know, or like really pushing hard. I mean, we have been organized in how we reach out to the community, but the community has been there. Um, and, and there are people, a lot of people who are really excited about this. And so a, a win to me is just, is just getting to see that and seeing that there was like already this pile of kindling there, um, a, mat, a match just needed only to be lit. And then um, it feels like we have real progress, like some real movement. And um, I'm excited to see where it, where it leads. Great. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're donating the band sales and streams and merch sales, I guess, uh, to the Greater Lafayette Legal Defense Fund for the month of December. Um, and we'll put the donate link in along with the, the video. And if there's anything else, if you have events coming up or anything that we can help you plug. Um, and I don't know, I just thank you a lot for joining us today. Um, Absolutely. Nessa, Eric, like, um, really respect the work you're doing and uh, hope we're able to help out. Thanks, Chris. This has been a, an honor to geek out about abolition work. Uh, yeah, I certainly appreciate it. I'm glad you came. Well,